Oh, hello there. Welcome back to another episode of the Agostino Zynga Show with me, your host, Agostino Zynga. And this is episode number two, seven, five, dos, siete, cinco, dos, siete, cinco. ¿Cómo estás, mi amigos? Bien. I'm feeling amazing. I can't say the rest of that in Spanish, but I'm going to get there hopefully sooner rather than later. Hope you guys are doing well. Hope you guys are doing good. Um, for those of you listening via the podcast app, as per usual, you will notice if you're watching via YouTube that this is nice and sunny. It's a very rare morning episode of the show, but I thought I'd get it in before, you know, the day progresses and I have to head off to work. So thank you. You're welcome. It's okay. For those of you watching via the podcast app and you like what I'm doing, make sure you share the show, make sure you spread it out there and let your friends know all the funny information that you get from yours truly. And if you're watching via YouTube, you know what to do. Smash that like button, click subscribe so you can come back another time. Um, I am the number one street air podcast in the world. The number one, where right, as voted by you, the people in the interwebs, the number one street air podcast in the world. For me, streetwear encompasses all aspects of art, fashion, music, culture, current events, uh, design, you know, all that other stuff, all included under the umbrella of streetwear for me, which is why I am the number one choice when it comes to streetwear news right here. The Agassi News English Show. <laughs> anyway, i um, not going to waste too much time. Because obviously I have to jet off to work, as I mentioned before. So we're going to get right on into it. There's so much stuff to get through. Paris Fashion Week stuff. Um, some London Fashion Week stuff. Some Milan Fashion Week stuff. Some other trainer stuff. Some stuff about DJing. All that good stuff is going to come to you live and direct via this camera here. If you're watching and you're thinking, why is the lighting a bit weird? It's because I put the blinds kind of quarter the way down. So some light is beaming through down here. And it makes my up. It makes me look like I'm in a horror movie or some something. You only get a flashlight and you kind of hold it underneath your face and you're kind of like, <laughs> I kind of look a bit evil and a bit sinister. If that's the case and you've got small children around and you're afraid of scaring them, maybe, you know, dim the brightness down on your screen or better yet, open a new tab and just have me playing in the background. No hard feelings. It's okay. People have done worse. Um, so let's get on in it. Let's get on. Let's get on. Let's get on. Let's get on. So much to go through. So um, first of all, this is what, what what news should we tell this? Yeah, let's let's share this news. This is interesting, right? I'm not sure what the point of this sort of stuff is, but again, you know, I'm sure brands spend a lot of money putting this stuff together. But I don't know as a consumer, especially maybe because I've been spoiled, because I've been behind the other side of the lens. I've been the model in these things. I've also been the kind of quote unquote consultant when people kind of get you in for to do a focus group and ask about your gear, right? Yeah, that's anyway. Let me show you. So. Um, the North Face has this um, thing, this editorial where they're celebrating 80 ski wear with extreme collection, with this extreme collection. And some, for some reason, they want to launch this 80 streetwear, this 80 ski wear thing. And they've got all these models posing in the heart of New York City somewhere. Well, and again, I know, I know, I know, I know. Those of you screaming, North Face is intrinsically tied to New York the same way you'd say Canada Goose is tied to Canada. But there's something quite odd about doing a ski wear launch in the middle of New York, no? Specifically Chinatown, it might look like. I'm, I'm not too sure. It looks a bit ridiculous, personally. Um, I do remember when I was going, um, when I went to New York, it was a long time ago, but I remember when I went to New York, uh, seeing a couple of the kind of low-life guys, some of the guys that wear head-to-toe um, vintage polo, Ralph Lauren and whatever. And it did look quite preposterous. I remember just looking at it thinking, oh, it doesn't look as cool as it does on the internet. On the internet, when they're all posing and doing their gang signs and shit, it looks quite interesting. But when you see grown adults walking down the street that way, it's just a bit like, hmm. It's a bit funny playing that kind of dress up and thinking you're hard because you wear old, you know, polo. It's a bit strange. So this is kind of a bit weird for me, personally, just as a visual. But the clothes themselves look pretty cool. You've got this ski wear collection, includes, I guess, duffel bags. and sh Are the sneakers part of the North Face thing as well? I wonder if oh, they're just generic Nike SUGs. I'm not too sure. But so far, looking at it, there's like these, um, these warm-up, I don't know warm-up pants, these kind of track pants. Or these whatever pants you might call them. I think um Supreme did the same pant, did it? Or was that a jumpsuit? It might be a pant or jump, not too sure, but it looks pretty cool. I like the size of the duffel bag. That's a nice healthy size for a gym or anything else, like a good weekend pack. Let's get here to the next slide and see what else they've got packed in here. Mm. Oops, come on. Let's work. Yeah, so the, the the pants look pretty cool. I quite like the pants. I like the shape of them. I like the 
um, how they drop on the trainers. Uh, this sort of poncho thing is, looks nice as well. The guys wearing the tracksuit all together. But again, it's quite ridiculous having him carrying, wearing this stuff in the middle of New York. It, it might have, if they were going to do this, they might have all gone full nut, full um, kitsch vibes and just had him carrying a pair of skis as well or wearing a pair of goggles. That would have just sealed the deal for me personally. But yeah, I'm not too sure. It's a weird thing, isn't it? It's weird. I quite like this outfit though. I think it's really nice. You got this weird kind of it's a tracksuit, I'm assuming. I'm pretty sure it's not a jumpsuit. I'll read the text in a minute. But I'm pretty sure it's a tracksuit. Looks pretty cool. But again, that looks really weird, isn't it? Walking in the middle of the city. Walking in the middle of like a metropolitan city wearing this sort of stuff, no? Don't you think it's a bit strange? Maybe it's just me. But the model looks cool. I like the hat. Is a hat North Face as well? I'm pretty sure it is, right? It's sort of like um a little five panel or whatever sports cap what, what's that model whatever we call it anyway let's read the text the north face has followed on from its british uh millinery collaboration by introducing the extreme collection which first debuted back in 1988 awesome the capsule was heavily influenced by big mountain skiers from the 80s with the functional controversial style reworked into 2020 re re ready styles what was it controversial back in the day because of the colors and stuff maybe i don't know the sound that piece is the extreme windsuit which comes in ex collection of Red, blue, sorry, red, black, blue, and color palette. Uh, elsewhere, the North Face is introducing a section of accessories, including a tough as hell backpack, burly crossbody bag, and two options of the breathable quick drying cap. Um, so that, that cap will be quite cool. I'm sure if you're a runner and you like wearing hats, I can't necessarily wear them. So, you know, case in point, my, my head's super huge and I've got a big, a big clump of hair at the top of it as well. But yeah, I'm not mad at it. I think it looks pretty cool. It's a nice collection, but again, why would you wear that in a city? Why is it being, why are they taking the pictures of it in a city landscape? I don't know. But again, maybe it's that kind of um, urban, what do you call it? Urban outdoorsman, whatever that kind of thing is. I remember I've done a couple of focus groups and stuff like this before, and it was a bit naff, to be fair. Um, you sit around just talking, you know, glowingly about yourself and about why it's important to wear stuff that's waterproof or Gore-Tex or, you know, breathable or warm or whatever it may be in the midst of you know a winter spent in london somewhere it's a bit self-explanatory but you kind of have to explain it away make it sound interesting and then they have to feign like it's the first time they've heard it it's just a really big it's a big cringe it's a big cringe fest really those focus groups but i'd imagine now if you're a brand director or marketing person you're most probably or most likely going to do these things via instagram now right you'll be able to find some amazing collectors via hashtags you won't need to go around asking old fuddy daddies like myself about what they think about the new collection about what works and what doesn't work because i have no idea i'm not tapped in <laughs> as much as these younger kids who are who are actually collecting stuff and being a part of that culture and stuff but yeah it's a bit weird man i'm not too sure if i'm keen on it but again i'm not mad at it if i was seeded it or given it i would wear it i wouldn't necessarily go out and buy it myself but um, when's that going to be available? Let's have a look here. Uh, uh, it's going to be available January 15th. So it should be available in your local North Face store now. January 15th is the Extreme Collection from North Face. So check it out. Check it on Ian. Let's move on. We have this brand called Yesterday's Tomorrow, who I've, I've not really heard much about. I don't know if you guys know the brand yourselves or if this is just me being old fuddy daddy and not understanding what's going on in the streets. But I saw his brand debuted on the Hype Beast. I stumbled across it on there. And it looks pretty cool, man. It reminds me of like Undercover. It reminds me of like, you know, those nondescript South Korean brands that generally kind of, you know, dress some of the bands in K pop and whatever. But I quite like it, man. So it's called uh, Yesterday's Tomorrow, I'm assuming. Uh, it's sort of abbreviated. So it's Y S T R D Y S and then Tomorrow without all the O's. Uh, riffs on grunge and Americana for spring summer 2020 so I guess it's a brand that people are aware of because you know they're commenting on it like it's a it's a brand that's been around for a while so this is here the text uh, yesterday tomorrow has returned with its 2020 uh, lookbook presenting a range of loosely tailored garments that riff on Americana and grunge inspirations embedded with contemporary twists some of the it's just a word salad on the hype isn't it just say stuff for the sake of it anyway let's not read that let's just go and look at the actual clothes forget the, the text so um yeah, I quite like it. Um, some really nice stable pieces. Um, some a good little in, uh, interpretation or a little bit of a twist on um, on kind of the staples you might have in your wardrobe. So, for instance, this first slide, you've got this jacket. I'm not too sure what it's called that jacket, but I remember I had I had um, I had a similar coat from Supreme. It was a Supreme JFA jacket 
what was that? What's that? What's that model called? It's called something. Oh, and it's got fucking thing on the back of it. It's, it's army. It's navy. It's yellow with olive on the olive on the back. It's got the sort of like, is it JFA? Supreme JFA. What was that? Is it was olive olive jacket? What's it called? Olive green jacket. It's like an army one, right? Uh, what was it called? And Double Taps always do a similar version of themselves for it too. It's a particular model. I forgot what the army coat is called. It's not an M3 Brie or something. I lost it when I went to Iceland back in the day, a long, long time ago. Um, it's a particular jacket. I'm pretty sure you guys know what I'm talking about. But I can't seem to wrap my brain around it. But anyway. Oh! So I can fucking find it. Let me think. Should I find it? How could I find it? Is it JFA? Anyway. Doesn't matter. Let's get back to the, to the actual collection. So um, they've got this coat that looks similar to the Supreme jacket that I had. It's um, it usually comes in like an olive green color, but I like the twist they've done in it. They've kind of made it in this sort of like cream beige sort of color. Um, again, it's a really good piece. It's something that you can wear easily with loads of different outfits. This outfit here, you've got an all white hoodie with Beethoven um, screen printed on the front, um, nice and loose with some burn is that burn marks or buy some badges on it and nice and loose fits and nice white pants and some great trainers too i'm not sure what the shoes are they might be a converse collab but they look really cool and i'm seeing this a lot quite often i'm seeing a lot of this um in uh, pants coming up i think Y project had some i think uh, d squared had some too wherever this seam is at the front it seems like it's a big trend um for the next season for menswear so if you're looking for some new pants whatever that style is called i don't know what it's called don't get technical with me but i've noticed that there's a lot of brands a lot of companies that are doing that kind of front seam you know sort of like the seam that you'd put on your trousers if you're ironing it um so that kind of is pretty cool to see as a little detail and if we continue on here yeah we have some really good pieces overall man i like everything i'm seeing here we've got this sort of like a ghana must go print on an overcoat um, some nice uh, slacks again and then you've got the trainers which i really like and then you've got the overcoat in a jean is it like a jean suit style or like a shirt style i love that i love the boots again so you've got these sort of like chelsea desert boot type style boots with like the zip at the front which reminds me of an undercover collection from a few seasons back no uh it reminds me of the soloist collection from a few seasons back where they had the zip at the back do you remember that there's like these boots from the soloist they had like a zip at the back they were so beautiful let me see if I can find a picture of those actually. Uh, let's see if I can find one. The solo, I think, is it the, the soloist? Uh, spring, I don't know what, what collection were the soloist boots. I say Chelsea boots. Let's see if I can, if they come up. I remember there was a pair of black boots. They came in red too, but they didn't come in my size, unfortunately. I did try to buy them, but I'm pretty sure they came out only to like a 43. But I'm sure that's the sort of thing that you have to kind of have the connects to be able to buy those sort of stuff. And I'd imagine so anyway. Um, let me see if I can find it. What was it? It was like, I think it was like spring, see, spring, summer 18 or something. It was the one where he had like a, it, the guy was just standing on the backdrop wearing like a suit jacket. Uh, uh, was it for winter 18? I don't think it was for, it must have been spring. It's like standing somewhere. Let me see if I can find it. Fall into 17. Nope, wasn't that one either. Let's try one more and then we we'll move on. Yeah, this is the one. So spring, summer 2017. They had these boots that were similar. As you can see, I'm going to put it up in the screen. So this is spring, summer 2017, the soloist. I remember these boots similar to the ones that you see from the yesterday's tomorrow. So it has this sort of zip at the front. See that? There? They've got the zip there at the front. And it's also got a zip at the back. That was a really good collection, man, to be fair. But bloody, bloody, bloody good collection from the Solobus. It's hard to get hold of. There's not many accounts in Europe, I think, for the most part. And again, I'm not too sure how many of the stuff they actually show in these lookbooks actually gets made or put into production. It must be low. But yeah, great stuff as per usual. Back in the day, remember when everyone was wearing hats? That hat would be so popular, innit? Sort of like a hat with a look, basically a, a Batman face on it. Um, it looks incredible. But yeah, anyway, let's go back to yesterday's tomorrow. Let's not their time but yeah i like the boots i love this sort of like um tablecloth kitchen cloth sort of style on the pants as well and i'm pretty sure it's a jean jacket or maybe a shirt and again great styling i like the lookbook simple white backdrop um some nice kind of um full loose shapes some easy to wear materials loads of great staples here you've got a nice suit 
with some couple with some high water pants, and then you got another pair of and then another suit on the right, which is a bit slouchy. Reminds me of some Wolf of Wall Street style. And then you got these great loafers with uh without the heel, these hills heel loafer slipper things, whatever they're called, which I'd prefer to wear more. I'd much I'd much be I'd be more keen to wear a pair of like Gucci loafer slides than a pair of actual plastic Adidas slides with the white socks. There's nothing that annoys me more than seeing that style around in the hood, man. It's such a shitty trend. Like, everyone's doing the same. Like, literally everyone. There's not one person that has, like, a different pair of slides on. It's just, ugh. But anyway, what can I do? Um, so, yeah, I like those brown boots, great loafers. And, again, just awesome styling. And the shapes or the sizes look quite full. So, they probably would lend themselves quite well to the European market. They're not, like, you know, the really boxy, small Japanese style or Japanese sizing that you'd see for most Asian brands. But I guess because it's South Korean, they tend to be a little bit bigger or taller on average than, I'd say, Japanese people, right? Probably. Is that bad to say? I'm pretty sure that's accurate. So... That's why some of the clothes tend to be one size fits all or a bit oversized, especially considering the kind of, you know, trend we're in at the moment with the oversized clothing. But yeah, it's all really good, man. I like this sort of like, is it suede or is that, yeah, I like that suede shirt deconstructed. It reminds me of like an engineered garment shirt. It's got the sort of like, you know, it's been uh, reworked, put back together as they say, right? So yeah, loads, loads of great pieces, man. Nice sort of side bag, nice olive pants again. A nice cardigan, a kafkan sort of stuff. So some copies of Needleless in here. So yeah, maybe it's a copy brand, isn't it? Because I can see a lot of capital. I can see a lot of needle, Needleless, sorry. Um, I can see a lot of that sort of like influence in these clothes. But again, it's done in a really cool way. I like this uh, denim aviator jacket. That's really interesting. I'm always a fan of brands that take like staple uh, mint outwear pieces and just flip the materials. I think that's something that doesn't get done too often. Especially because most dudes tend to, I know for myself, I tend to wear the same sort of, the same three to five staple outwear pieces. And then I tend to get a bit crazy when it comes to the actual, whatever I wear clothing wise, like a shirt or a pair of trousers and trainers. But mostly when it comes to coats and jackets and stuff, there's there's only a few stuff I kind of go for. You know, the quintessential bomber jacket, a pea coat, a biker jacket, or leather jacket, biker jacket, um, trench coat, um, what you call it, like a like a waterproof jacket sort of thing like a north face sort of style so there's only a few shapes you go for so if your brand can take those shapes or take those styles and just rework them you know different materials different cut different finish i think that really goes a long way so i like this denim, denim aviator again probably something that a lot of people will be a fan of and maybe it's a bit too fear of goddy but i quite like it so yeah some some nice stuff from uh, yesterday's tomorrow I'll read a text in a minute and see if it's Korean. I'm not too sure if it is Korean. It might not be, but I like it. Uh, da, da, da. Oh, it's a Chinese brand. Okay. After the Chinese red blue. Okay. I didn't know that. It's, it's Chinese. Jesus. Is it? Is it Chinese? Okay. Is that the comment here? <laughs> I mess with this brand, but either the model is five foot two or the cut of these clothes is way off. I don't think a commentator, a commentator on hype is sitting on his, you know, lap somewhere covered in cheat or dust can make an opinion on what a cut of an item is but you know this is the internet everyone has a voice so anyway um check that out um it's spring summer from yesterday's tomorrow it's going to be available now on their website so it should be there now at the moment let's quickly check over hop over to their site and see if that's true get that off the window as well boom 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 yeah yesterday's tomorrow there we go what language is it if i try and translate Oh, it's Japanese, okay. It's not even South Korean, my bad. It's Japanese. It looks good though, man. I like it. These are all the lookbooks. Let's see the shop. See what the prices are saying on this brand. But it's quite a cool brand. I like it. Yesterday's tomorrow. I like the name as well. Japanese people always have a good way of flipping names, isn't it? Especially using English uh, spelling. There's no real rhyme or reason why it's called Yesterday's Tomorrow. It's just Yesterday's Tomorrow. Founded in 2017, Yesterday's Tomorrow fuses elements of vintage clothing, streetwear, and high fashion, culminating the overall impression that is both nostalgic and new. Uh, diverse in both its inspiration and range, Yesterday's Tomorrow is one of the Tokyo's most exciting, highly anticipated new brands. Okay, that's great. Good to see. So I guess my eye isn't isn't leaving me. It is quite a cool and interesting new brand. So yeah, check it out, man. Some good stuff in Yesterday's Tomorrow. Some nice items available now at this place called Cover Cord. But yeah. It should be available now for all you guys to see. I'll leave the link in the show notes so you guys can check out if you want to see it. Move on. What else we have here? Oh, um, 
I made like a little comment. This is like a little note uh, regarding the Nike Dunk. I'm sure some of you guys have, are aware of what's happening with the Dunk, right? There's been a huge Dunk resurgence in the last few couple of years, I'd say. You know, you had um, Virgil obviously wearing them quite often. You had Travis wearing them quite often. You had a few other notable people. Then obviously the off-white collection, collections come out. You've got Travis debuting his new SBs. There's a few new other SBs coming that have got re-released. The Ray Guns. They're going to be re-releasing the Plums. Uh, but mostly just dunks. Forget the SB, but it looks like it's a, it's a big year for the dunk, and it happens quite often. I remember when I used to work for 1948 or for Nike back in the day. There was a big sub. I think that was like the 30th anniversary of the dunk, might have been, or 35th. I forgot. That was when the whole Be True to Your School dunk campaign came out, and that did that did didn't do too well. It kind of felt like a lead balloon for the most part. Um, the dunk is a weird shoe. I get the feeling that it. It's probably it probably should be a lot cooler or a lot tr more trendy than what it actually is, but it didn't really do the damage it probably needed to. And it would be interesting. I'm just thinking about it, hypothesizing if all of this effort that Nike are making to try and engineer a resurgence. Because to be honest, it's not organic. No real, ki no kids that follow Virgil or follow Travis or you know creep on Playboy Carter. You really or ASAP Rocky, really give a shit about wearing dunks. Not really. It's not really an organic thing. Most of those kids are still wearing Jordan 1s, Yeezys, and whatever expensive designer shoe they can get a hold of. You don't really see people organically wearing Nike dunks. So it feels like, to me, um, Nike are kind of finagling and trying to engineer a resurgence or a revival of something that doesn't really exist for the most part. So it would be quite funny if they spent all this money, put out all this outreach, did all these activations, and it just all of it ended up on the sales rack. I could see it eventually happening because some of these shoes, especially the Raygun SBs, like who wanted those to come back again? Such a weird model to like kind of take out, to kind of rebirth or to kind of give another opportunity. You know? Like Nike, especially Nike SB, wasted so many opportunities to kind of really give, uh, resuscitate, um, you know, the Nike Dunk range when they keep going back to someone like Jeff Staple and he keeps rehashing tired, boring, uninspired pigeon interpretation of a dunk again and again and again. You just lose any caveat, any kind of sense of cool. And all these little cool micro brands and little streetwear brands that these young kids have got, they're the ones that should be kind of spearheading the dunk resurgence or dunk revival. Because old fogies like myself, I'm not going to give a shit about these new Dunk Revivals because I was there when it happened, right? I bought most of the SBs. I was back, I was around when you used to go to Nike, you used to go, I used to go to Slam City Skates and get vibed out for buying Nike Dunks, right? Now, Slam City Skates are essentially jacking off sneakerheads when they come into the store. But I remember back in the day, what's his name? Is it Jake or whatever? Is it Jake? I forgot. There was that really short guy um, who's always really angry. He always had like a kind of resting angry face anyway. He kind of warmed up later on, but he was always really snarky and just a bit, you know, a bit short with me um which is understandable right i, I would rock up to slam city skates wearing my hundreds t-shirts and hundreds jeans and you know a new york thing air force ones and stuff i'm sure he kind of looked at me and thought what absolute weapon but it's interesting to see how things have changed now you know skaters don't keep the lights on essentially sneakerheads do um unfortunately for some of these nike for some of these uh, uh skater owned stores but it's interesting to see that they're instead of going to the people who are actually trying to Instead of actually going to people who would be the consumers for this, they're trying to somehow tap into nostalgia and get someone like me to give a shit about dunks, which is preposterous. Maybe the Viotex I liked and I liked the look of and I would probably get, uh, but, uh, I would probably buy on resale from StockX or something, but there's no way in hell that I'm kind of busting the gut to go buy a pair of dunky, uh, dunks to wear again. Like i done it. It happened. We move on in it. It's not a thing. I'm not trying to revive my old um glory years of sneaker them and this is another good example of it isn't it like the plum dunk lows again it's not the hype colorway where the kids want they want the dunks that are gonna make them a thousands of pounds or that the ones that they seen pharrell wearing and shit or whatever it's not gonna work man i just don't think it's gonna work so i think it's a big big waste of time apart from again the off-white dunks were an interesting experiment i've seen a lot of street star pictures of people wearing them in paris and they've absolutely they, they make them look shit because you know it's fashionistas wearing trainers. It's never a good combination. But that worked because, again, he was, you know, Virgil is from the school of sneakerheads, right? He is from the in the University of Nike talk. So he understood the re the relevance of kind of re-earthing or bringing back those three colorways and kind of t giving it his Virgil twist with those sort of like climbing rope things across the top. So essentially just a classic dunk with those kind of additional, those rope things, which, you know, makes it looking more interesting. But... <laughs> as a model i don't think there's a lot of people out there really crying for the plums to come back maybe if you're a kid in tokyo now you might be happy with it because you can wear these with your oversized 501s 
put your hands in your pocket and do a pose that you're standing in the magazine like Boone or whatever but I'm not too sure if like European kids North American kids who are wearing Yeezys and you know Jordan 1s are going to give a shit about wearing a pair of these I just can't see it and it, to me it just feels like they're they're making they're trying to re- they're trying to they're trying to make a trend as opposed to allowing it to kind of breathe and happen, you know, organically. You don't make trends. I don't think so anyway. Maybe I'm wrong, but it doesn't feel like you can engineer a trend to it to happen just because you want it to happen. Um, but yeah, here is the Plum Dunks. Uh, 2001 Dunk Plum is returning to turn in February. Here's the text. 2020 shaping up to be a, tr- a fruitful year for Nike's time on a dunk. Uh, one of the classic colorways that's uh, getting the ball rolling as a plum and makeup that originally debuted in 2001 as part of the nike japan exclusive ugly duckling pack alongside the veneer and the ceramic styles the plum is an appealing look back at the bygone era and in the no regional exclusives uh combining a two-tone blah, 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 blah. this comp this compelling crash of colors was so beloved by collectors that, that nike sb even re-released it as a fat tongue uh sb high in a near identical color scheme back in 2011 however the revamped in- iteration is the first ever re-release of the og dunk low which is cool in it i guess it reminds you of the old silver boxes or in, uh, yellow box dunks actually before they were even in, involved in sbs before they had a the massive tongue before they had the crazy insoles before they had the padded collars uh before they had the, the tongue that was strapped down like all those kind of things remind me of it so february the 7th they're going to re- come back out again they've got these sort of like old school vintage um magazine editorial graphic designs which again looks terrible they didn't really they didn't redo the laces if you've seen any japanese sneaker magazine you'll know that all the sneakers are always laced immaculately i'm actually going to pull a magazine out here because sometimes i think these guys man so the lack of attention to detail sometimes and the things that matter is just frightening isn't it? so here's a copy of this magazine called asayan i'm going to get this back on full screen here this magazine called asayan it's like a legendary japanese magazine and i'm pretty sure every shoe in here especially the nike shoes all the all the laces are laced up properly there's no fucking crazy shitty laces that these guys are put on their shoes right this is a random magazine i pulled out from my archive of magazines right and i'm pretty sure every product shot of a trainer will have the trainer laced up the correct way not the way that they have it laced up there where you know the way you see it when it comes out of a box it's all strangled and it's all over over instead of under uh over under it's like under over you know it's not like even this model here wearing on the left look at this model look he's look, look at that look at that model there Can you see him here and look at his laces look look see properly laced up right let's go to the next one trying, i'm just gonna try and find some product shots see all these product shots look at this what, what shoes this north wave look at these Jap- old school shoes right and let's zoom in on the yellow one at the top there you see that one look at that look at the laces right look at those laces and now look at the laces on these fucking dunks right look at that horrendous right absolutely horrendous look at look, look at the laces if you're gonna re if you're gonna redo these dunks and bring them back again and try and get nostalgic points like at least go f- all the way if you're gonna with this creative direction like come on man bring the bring the pain they must have an archive full of this stuff they must have people working at nike who know what's up and are, were a part of culture back in the day they need to make more of an effort man it's so lazy another one right i'm gonna get the screen back to normal again look another one again there can you see that look 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 at, look at all the shoes look how look how well look how well laced everything is move the oh move my hand out of the way there but look how well laced everything is everything is laced properly no shitty lacing everything is laced how it should be laced can you see that probably not but anyway just i don't know man just it's frightening the people that have these kind of jobs and don't know how to lace shoes there's a whole heap of nikes there as well can you see them like there right look all of those are are properly laced up it's just like all of these are proper oh look at these look at that just just re-release all of that look at that look at look at those trainers there look what you got there Zoom in on that one. Oh, let's move in a bit. See that? Look at that. Look at the selection. Look at the selection. Look at those. Nice, isn't it? Nice, 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 nice. But yeah, what do I know? Um, like I said, it would be interesting if they would make all this effort to bring back the Nike and you just see them all on the sale rack at flipping office size and TK Maxx and stuff. It would be so funny. But again, it's Nike, innit? They've got so much money. It probably doesn't even matter if it does flop. And what is a flop to Nike anyway, really? 
if it doesn't sell out, maybe the perceived flop online from like, you know, people that like to resell shoes, maybe, oh, it didn't sell out, the shoes flopped, but for the most part, they could probably write off all that shit, doesn't matter. So anyway, um, let's move on, man. Nike Dunks are coming back. They're back in. They're gonna be back in February. That Plum one on the seventh, I think it says here, right? Yeah, on the seventh, they're gonna be priced at one hundred and ten pounds. <laughs> oh, Nike are jokes. Imagine paying one hundred and ten pounds for Dunks to two thousand and twenty, mate. That is a madness. But anyway, do your thing if that's you. Let's move on. Um, we've got Awake NY have collaborated with Carhartt, and it's flipping good. I've just seen this, right? I don't know if this is old news and everyone else is kind of aware of what's going on, but. This looks really good, man. Um, Angelo Back, have you pronounced his name? Um, one of the um, ex honchos at Supreme who kind of decided to hang up his Supreme hat and go and seek Pasha's new and start his own little project, which he, were, he was doing already at the side when he was at Supreme. Because if you know Angelo's background, you know he's kind of you know part of the original Nom de Guerre crew. That was like a kind of old school streetwear staple back in the day during the whole retail mafia era. So he was always doing the wake on the side, but I guess if you're working full time at Supreme, there is no time to kind of run your own little micro brand. So he had to decide what you had to do going forward. And there's only so much juice you can give Supreme before you start thinking, you know what, I want to speak to kids in my own way. And for the most part, I think as per usual, the, the thing I like about streetwear in general, personally for me, is that we tend to give brands time to grow and to kind of mature. And then they kind of have, they kind of have to show and prove they're good. You back them if they're not good you just ditch them in the end in it and you go somewhere else but it's nice to see like us giving brands an uh, opportunity to kind of get more successful over time and i guess um awake and this car collaboration is a good example of this because i think the first collection i saw from awake i wasn't that impressed with i was a bit like that's oh, a bit basic but then over time you started to see him introduce some different pieces some hats some t-shirts you got to see his artistic vision in terms of the lookbooks in terms of the models used the photography the tones everything was kind of pointing to the direction of, okay cool this guy's got a bigger vision a bigger goal in mind just as opposed to just making clothes there's something else he's trying to do something else he's trying to say which kind of again made me think okay cool now it makes sense why he left supreme because i guess most people, especially if you're obsessed with working in cool places and you don't care about creating or making your own thing or kind of leaving your own little mark on a cultural timeline, you would be like, oh my God, I can leave Supreme. But, you know, if you have a bigger vision for yourself or you think you need, you, there's more you can offer the world and you want to just create and maybe speak to a different audience, then why not? Right? It's only a job. It's a cool one, don't get me wrong, but it's still a job at the end of the day, isn't it? So um, this Awake car collaboration kind of, for me, marks... Um, awake really going to the next level this is kind of them really carving out their own little path and really solidifying their position as one of the kind of uh, undercover brands to kind of look out for in the street right in the, in the street market at the moment there's so many i think i mentioned it previously like if you're a kid now and you're obsessed only with palace and supreme you're really cutting yourself short there's so many other good brands out there that can supply that look for you um without kind of you know having to um without having to kind of you know uh you know, lose a lose a part of your own dignity trying to get these things when you go and queue up at the store or try and buy stuff online. So this is a lookbook here from Hype Beast. It says the following: uh, Awake and Why reworked car heart work in progress staples and a new collaborative capsule. And what I like about this straight away is that the first two shots, boom, color. I don't think I've seen a car heart collaboration with this much color ever in my life. It's always kind of been really monotone, really pulled back, stripped back, basic workwear color schemes you know the browns and navies the blacks um yeah the sandy kind of colorways that's it you don't really see a car you don't see car anything in this like bright fuchsia blue uh with this orange and a lime green lining with contrast stitching massive look contrasting logos big logos on the beanie hat like it's really really bright really colorful and again really fun and playful i love everything about it um so again you got this amazing i don't know sure what jacket that is from carhartt work in progress i'm not sure what model that is that he's wearing there at the top but i love it it's got sort of lime green inner you've got a nice hoodie as well with i'm always i've, I've been a big fan of contrast stitching for a while i think that's why i like the i think it was was it stussy and carhartt um that was it that black suit they had it was like a track suit had like a work jacket with some bottoms in it with some yeah i'm pretty sure it was a it was it might have been a car collaboration it sold out instantly though um it's all like a jacket with like contrast stitching like black with like my favorite is obviously black with white contrast and stitching like you know give me an outfit with black and con and white contrast and stitching and i'll wear that every single day man so good so yeah i love the colorway the color scheme is really really good 
Um, I like the addition of these pockets or whatever they may be. Oh, you know what they might be? Those pockets. They might be the same pockets that you get when you uh, when you wear Carhartt, when you buy Carhartt trousers or the kind of workman trousers. They've got their little kind of, you know, tall or I think accessory pockets at the front where you can kind of throw some shit in. Um, it reminds me of that. So they've kind of taken those pockets and put them on the top of the jacket and you get these nice little pockets that you can kind of rest your hands in. Do that kind of bad man, you know, the little bad man pose. Um, yeah, massive. Love it, man. Big logos on the back. Because again, for me, not not for me personally, the logos on the back. But I guess if you're speaking to a particular demographic, a particular age group, they're going to absolutely love it. Uh, great colors. Again, the one in black and pink is just insane with the contrasting hoodie and the beanie. That look on the left is really good. And again, man, just awesome. Like great use of models, great shoot. Uh, great beanie, great collection. Everything in it looks really, really good, man. I really like it. It's an amazing collection. I'm sure I'm not sure how this flew under my radar, but very, very good work from Awake. Um, following on this is release, this is just text from them. Following on from the release of the collaboration with Sports Trekker Boot, the Timberland last week, the New York based uh, streetwear imprint Awake NY has returned with a workwear heavy range alongside Carhartt, which is you have to think, especially if they got New York in their name. And you see this collaboration. This looks very, very much like New York, but done in a very contemporary way. I'm sure the kids out there now that would wear Carhartt would want to wear it this way, or maybe it's just a, it's just him riffing on the kind of DIY, do it yourself sort of like custom uh, fashion trend that's happening at the moment with kids sort of like flaring their jeans and spray painting, whatever it may be called. Because I can imagine if he gave this to an artist of some notoriety, like if you gave these jackets and pieces to maybe like an ass piece or someone, they would make this look sick. Um, anyway, continue on. Uh, Sports Trekker boot from Timberland. The Wake Rise returned with a workwear heavy range alongside Car WIP, offering um, 12 pieces in total. The newly unveiled capsule brings together Carhartt's utilitarian utilitar- Utilitarian, utilitarian, however you pronounce that word, aesthetic alongside a wake street, a uh, few sensibilities. Um, aptly taking inspiration from vintage hunting gear, the capsule highlights the workwear brand's Michigan coat staple rework to include contrasting pockets. Oh, okay, it's a, it's a jacket that, that Michigan State panels throughout, finished with an embroidered co brand on the back side. The two brands have also included a car whip script sweaters offered up in three unique contrasting colorways. They're going to be available on January 17th, which is today, so definitely check that out if you're that way inclined. It looks amazing. They've got a pop up shop happening now in Paris because that's where all the menswear peeps are at. So definitely make your way over there if you want to do that because this looks amazing. I love it all, man. All looks really, really cool. Very, very cool. Probably my favorite cap- car collection I've seen in a while, man. I, I quite liked, um, I think the recent one, Dover Street Market North Face, I thought that was pretty cool. The DSM stuff, but this is really, really nice, man. Really, really nice. I've got to be honest. It's super, super good. Good stuff from Carhartt. Or oh, from everyone involved. Love it. And the way it's smashing it, man. Yeah. But that, that black and pink one, oof, this one here, that's the one, bro. That is the one. That is the one so good but yeah check it out should be available later on today at all your wake places and again if you're in paris then definitely go pop by the pop-up shop to see it for yourself okay let's move on There's this long article about the AES 50th anniversary, but I'm going to talk about that another time. Let's move on for that one. And let's go to... Virgil saying streetwear is done. Let's do that one. Yeah, This is an interview from Virgil from Days and Confused, I think, just before the springs or the all the fashion week shows at the moment um i'm assuming this happened during that time right yeah this was published on the 17th of december 2019 it's an article from days it's been a while but i haven't spoken about it so i'll probably speak up i'll just quickly touch on it now from days and confused magazine it says virgil abloh streetwear is definitely gonna die the artistic director of louis vuitton menswear on the last 10 years and the next so obviously it was i think it was like a decade in review they interviewed a few people on there but you know i'm just going to read this for the interest of everyone else listening and then we can talk about some of the issues that he kind of spoke about right so it's nice little pictures on here kind of highlighting some of his you know um defining moments pyrex you've got the future and louis you got that occasion when you did the first show with louis vuitton and you got some off-white stuff right so let's continue here this is written by a lady called emma hope alwood so let's continue um 
deep fakes influences viral fashion we live in a world um, unrecognizable from the one we stood in 10 years ago as a chaotic decade comes to a close we're speaking to the people who helped shape the last 10 years okay let's continue 10 years ago virgil abloh then working as creative director for kanye west was one of the group uh was one of a group photographed outside of the comedy garçon show in paris their outfits which included goyard briefcases colorful thick rimmed glasses and leopard print trousers with cowboy boots inspired a wave of internet scorn much of it was homophobic um i'm not too sure if that was if it was homophobic i think most of the that infamous picture where they're all standing outside where is it again was it called um is there, is there does she got a link to it nope they're all tags in it. All these are tags, unfortunately. There was a skit about it. Let's see. So, yeah. Uh, uh, Kanye West. South Park. I don't know. Paris. I don't know what it's called. That. I don't know. What, what was that picture called again? Their first time in Paris. So they're all posing. Yeah, this one, right? So, um... Again, I'm not rewriting history. I don't know if this was if you guys had the same inter interpretation, but when this picture first came about, I remember it wasn't necessarily maybe in the hip hop community there were some people were maybe saying these guys were gay, right? But this was still kind. He was still an influencer in that regard. Like people still looked at him as like a fashion icon. So it wasn't a gay thing. It was more so they just looked goofy, and it? it was just a goofy outfit, goofy crew. They just looked all like kind of goofballs. And again, it worked for them in the end. I think sometimes you can look back on stuff that you did that was quite goofy and quite nerdy and a bit cringe. And because you're successful now, you can sort of like ju justify it because of the position you're in now and say, oh, yeah, you know, I always knew that thing I did there was going to set me on my path to do this, what I'm doing now. And that necessarily isn't the case. You could just you could just say, hey, we were some young, enthusiastic, passionate kids trying to get into the fashion industry. We had no way of getting in. So we thought we'd just rock up where we wear what we wore and just kind of you know try and crash the system that way fair enough but to say like this was some kind of defining moment or the outfits were you know um gender bending or whatever is ridiculous like they all looked goofy no one there looked good apart from maybe taz arnold right everyone didn't really have their own personal style at the moment they're all kind of you know clumsily uh walking around trying to figure out what worked for them outfit wise and brand wise and eventually they got there in it so it worked on the end but to say that this was some sort of like i don't know uh defining a moment in style and in terms of you know accepting homosexuality and hip-hop is just pfft, nah not for me anyways continue um in june 2018 i saw i saw some of that same group reunite backstage at abloh's debut show for louis vuitton which was amazing right to see him to see kind of you know everything that happened everything that led up to it the fact that it was a job that probably Kanye wanted all his, look, he probably dreamed about, you know, calling himself the Louis Vuitton Don. Virgil ends up getting it because he's probably able. I always look at Kanye and Virgil like Dame Dash and Jay-Z. Um, Kanye is more Dame. Virgil obviously is more Jay-Z. He's able to kind of politic and kind of work with and collaborate with the higher ups and the quote unquote culture vultures. Whereas Kanye and Dame are the ones kind of shouting from the rooftops about you know they want brand equity they want uh ownership and all that sort of stuff and just ruffling too many feathers so they're not necessarily able to work with a big corporate brand so anyway virgil gets a job kanye kind of probably feels away from it from behind the scenes read between the lines you don't need to be an expert to, to see that and we get to see a combination of their emotions when they hug each other and kind of you know start sobbing and crying because you know fashion is their passion so he continues um in a video i took ablo embraces ib and jasper whose blog about the backlash in, two, two, uh, in two uh, the 2009 trip remains online. What we were actually doing is showing the world that American men, let alone black men, know how to really get busy when it comes to the fashion game. I've been just, but talks a lot of shit. He does cut, cuts a good trim. He does make some good skate shoes and he's a hell of a skater, but he does talk some, he does talk out of his ass sometimes. I don't know what that's about, but again, um, there is maybe a thing about, you know, it being these straight black men arrive into a fashion week right because back then for the most part the only people really showing out were you know magazine editors you remember that was a time when everyone was obsessed with the vogue paris crew right in terms of street style so loads of women or loads of kind of overtly gay guys so there weren't a lot of straight dudes kind of doing the thing um so maybe that but again i don't think it was that big of a deal really and truly they have money they have means they could go to paris and just arrive there and use their celebrity to kind of you know get into as many shows as they can some shows you can't get into because some brands don't care about celebrity especially back then when social media wasn't as big as it is now now i think every brand will welcome some level of exposure through a celeb 
But yeah, I don't know, man. I think they rewrite history a little bit because they're successful now. Which again, they're fair to they 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 are more than I encourage you to do so because you know they did what they did. But let's call a spade a spade. La, 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 la. Uh, what we're actually doing is showing the fashion world that American men, let alone black men, know how to really get busy when it comes to fashion game. All right, cool. He wrote, and um, we can't be erased. Right, that's that reminds of like the Jews cannot replace us. Remember that those people chanting that sort of stuff. Bit strange that um, Ablo says as they hug, he smiles and uh, and the smile of a man who just fought to be there, an outsider no longer. Anyway, let's continue and get to the interview. So, um, the interview here, um, where I want to start is actually in 2009 with that famous Tommy Tom Fashion Week photo. How do you feel about it now? Virgil says, if you look back at it in 2019, it, it predicted the idea of democratization of fashion. It's like those impart- imp- imp- uh, inspirational quotes that say you get made fun of and then in the future everyone adopts what we are making fun of. But not really. I don't think anyone's wearing, um, you know, Tiffany blue uh, body warmers and a weird shirt and trousers that don't fit and yellow trainers. None of this stuff is like, you know, the time. I don't, I don't know. It's just strange to say that this stuff was, what did it do? inspire kids to go to fashion week and stand outside of shows maybe maybe that was social media maybe that was a street style i don't know but they're taking a he's taking a bit too much credit for this i think um but that was one of the fir- very first modern fashion images that just went everywhere uh it said that uh, um, it said that those who love fashion are just as important as the industry itself yeah i agree with that 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 was a big part of it because i think that was one of the big criticisms a lot of the fashion editors were kind of um pointing towards Kanye when he put his first show down the Paris Paris runway, right? Remember the first um, Kanye West collection that was, wasn't that well made, wasn't that well styled. It was just a bit, you know, last minute dot com. It was just somebody really eager, really interested in fashion with the means and the money to just put up the money, put up the funds and just make a fashion show, right? He just put it on himself, which is great to see. Um, I think as an artist, I think as a creative, to see someone actually, because that's the thing you have to kind of give ratings to Virgil and all that crew, right? They don't talk a lot. They just do. They make. They do. They put their. They put their mouth. They put their money where their mouth is, and they kind of risk it all. They put stuff out. If it doesn't sell out, they have to kind of, you know, wear that L on their chest. Um, they play in places, and it might, you know, they might clear the dance floor. Like they're persi- They're constantly putting themselves on the front line. So I give them all the props for that. And again, um, I think that was one of the weird criticism they pointed towards the Kanye saying, "Oh, um, just because you're a fan of fashion doesn't mean you should be making it." And it's like, what? Um, there was actually a quote. I've met, it might be a Vogue. Um, it might be a Vogue runway quote, or it might be a uh, what's it? What's her face? Uh, what's the what's the face with, with the, what's the face? What, what's the woman that looks like Quentin Tarantino? Uh, reviews clothes, whatever her name is, right? I remember he used something along those kind of lines, like a really snarky remark, just because he like clothes shouldn't be making fashion. Like, what are you talking about? That's the whole reason why everyone makes fashion, right? You make fashion or you make clothes because there's something missing in your wardrobe, and then over time you start to build that wardrobe out, and then you might have a brand. You might have a little micro brand. You might have a streetwear brand. You might have a fashion brand. You might have a, a direct to consumer. Whatever it may be, it comes from a need, a want, something that's missing in your wardrobe, and you kind of create it yourself because you're creative. So that was a weird thing. So that I agree with. Anyway, it continues. Um, it spoke to the power of self-produced image. Jack and Jill was a blog that Tommy had. Yep, that was awesome. Probably one of the best, and still more maybe the best streetwear or street style blog or photography out there. Like honestly, like such a good place to kind of go back to and look at all the trends that happened from yesteryears he had a real good eye tones um eye for deep detail shapes movement just incredible photographer shame that he kind of we lost him to the fashion world but you know he's probably doing bigger and brighter things now uh, that image was a collaboration between his following and us a collaboration come on man he took the picture and you guys stood there man let's just mama mia um how did the fashion industry feel to you then how welcoming was it and I like because he's he's optimist, right? He's always a bit he's he's always a bit happy, happy, clappy and stuff. So I like his honesty here. It wasn't particularly welcoming, but the irony was that there was no security at the door at the Comme des Garçons show. We went to went to get into, which is cool, isn't it? Because I guess back then, especially if you're, which is probably why. Imagine, yeah, being around back then, going to shows must have been so fun because it's not what it is now, right? Now you they they're flying over the likes of Cardi B and stuff, and she's walking around with like seventeen special forces, right? uh so the security is having to get heightened in shows and it's just not the same and i'm sure after the that terrorism event that happened in paris too uh that didn't help things either that, but that was a weird time then right you could just probably rock up to a show no invite and get talking to the you know the african security guard you know drop him some uncle bars maybe slip him a couple of euros and you could probably go and see a comedy on show right as long as you kept you know kept stum and didn't make too much of a noise you'll be all right 
It continued here. Um, by halfway through the decade, you, you've you gone from standing outside to having your first off-white show in Paris. What did the moment represent to you? Ablo said, I was at this point in fashion where my contemporaries and friends like Shane Oliver, but who by was super important to the narratives, were painting this picture of what's to come. At that time, the informal press was only just categorizing that type of designer streetwear. As a designer... You get confronted with the term of your generation, which you have no control over. Okay, that's fair. So you're there, you're making clothes, and they suddenly put the label of streetwear on you when you didn't bestow that on yourself, and you feel a bit constrained by it. I understand, right? From that frustration, I decided if streetwear was going to be the sign of the times, I was going to define it rather than be defined by it, which I like, right? So again, this is the thing about Virgil. For all his inability to make good clothes consistently or with any kind of, you know, rhyme or reason i like his methodology i like his way of thinking I like the fact that he's kind of open and says these things so that when kids are reading it they can be like oh okay this is the mindset i need to have when i'm going into things so instead of kind of being shackled by the term street he decided to kind of embrace it and wear as a badge of honor and kind of and if, if, if anything the whole industry has a lot to thank him for in terms of keeping streetwear quote-unquote alive in the sense that it injected more money into it from the mainstream from big brands she will always survive. It's always going to be around. We're, we're perfectly fine, you know. People like um, Nick from Diamond and Supplier, he's a multi-millionaire just from streetwear. He didn't need to, like, dabble in a fashion game and suck people up in Paris. He's just done his stuff, sat in the Beverly Hills and bought himself Ferrari. So streetwear can work. It can make people rich and successful. It can make people, you know, be able to look after their families, um, employ friends and whatever it may be. But it's also good to kind of get that injection from hedge funds, from big brands, from uh you know the lvmhs of this group and all that sort of stuff like it's good to get their eyes on it too so it kind of allows people to kind of have a second lease of life like you know futura is in paris now uh doing that whole gore-tex kirk exhibition i told you before um it's good to see stash those guys around paul mitterman's hanging around there all these guys that were fundamental to where streetwear um has come to come from are still getting money, which is then allowing them to pass the money down to the young generation, or then allowing them to pass it down. So it kind of goes on and on. So we have lots to thank for him in that regard. Anyway, it continues. Um, I feel that at the time, most people would be like, oh, he's not a stereotypical designer. I don't know how many shows I've done since 2016, but it's been enjoyable to define the space that I would perceivably be put myself in. My motivation is this whole time has been to represent for a generation. I'm still thinking about the kid that couldn't get into fashion shows. This is the thing that I have a problem with with this guy, I think, personally. I think I still have a bit of a hang up on the whole Ralph Lauren rugby shirts. Remember when he made those off white? I mean, so it was off white or the Paris Vision? The Paris Vision uh, flannels that he bought from Ralph. He bought out the entire stock and he then screen printed the back of them. Didn't didn't even update the tag. Didn't replace the buttons or edit the cut in any sort of way in a kind of needless reworked fashion. He just screen printed twenty three on the back, um, Pyrex, and then sold them for five hundred dollars. And it was insane, right? And I remember that was the era when he was talking about, I'm here for the kids, I'm doing it for the kids, for the kids, for the kids. And I was just thinking, this guy is like a charlatan, to say the least, right? It's obviously a cash grab, fair enough, but he's kind of, he. Uh, this was during the era as well, I think, when we saw the dusty Ian Connor. Remember Ian Connor on Tumblr wearing the Yeezys and stuff? That was that era when he kind of noticed that there was this really fervent, uh, younger demographic of kids coming up who were just obsessed with their little icons in the scene like that was young luca young ian maybe mike the ruler maybe a less fat Cohen. there's a few people right in the scene that were kind of bubbling maybe not rocky because he wasn't wearing that kind of stuff at, at that time but there was a time when he kind of recognized okay these are the new icons so he kind of latched onto that whole idea about kids 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 and he kept talking about it but then none of his clothes really related back to the kids he was talking about he was printing on champion sweats and selling them for 300 dollars which is like this guy's insane. So sometimes I think it's a bit convenient to use the term streetwear because, again, it has a core point. It allows him to kind of... Uh, it allows him a safety net if... if Because fashion's fickle. If they decide tomorrow that he's washed up and untalented and not worth the time, then he will fall back into streetwear or fall back into design trope, which is probably why he doesn't call himself a, a fashion designer in that regard. But it's a bit annoying. I don't know. I, I find it a little bit... I find it a bit, a little bit disingenuous, personally. That's just me, again. Maybe it's just my own hang-up on it, but I find it a bit disingenuous um, how you can talk about being for the kids and try and resell them flannels for $500 that you bought for $30. It's just like, what? Um, again, I'm not telling him to sell it for $50, but come on, man. $500? Really? That's insane. Uh, 
Da, da, da. Do you think at that point in 2016, the industry uh, started to open up that was, it was becoming more of a democratic space and it feels closer now? I've never been one to feel that the doors were closing, which is awesome, right? I'm an optimist, so I don't even recognize that. That's how I got to where I'm at. I think what has helped it go along was streetwear was also a, goal con a global concept. Designers like myself and Shane had the advantage that European designers in the vein of streetwear helped people understand what's new. Uh, what's the new wave was going to be designers like Demna and Gosha were all a part of the same creative community we all played a part in what's happened to Gosha man since those allegations came about he has been MIA he just makes clothes and doesn't appear anywhere innit? Um, I wish they could do it to Aaron as well Aaron Bondroff like uh, again the allegations against him weren't the best but you know I hope, wish there was a word for redemption some of these OGs that kind of you know were such an important part of my life or part of me growing up and forming my kind of creative vision I wish there was a way back for Aaron Bondroff because we do miss him on the scene, man. It's, uh, I'm we watched that Harry Preston video of him talking about the rec center again. It's just cool, man. Like, I wish he was back again, man. But anyway, um, continue. Um, how did it feel to see the rest of the industry, traditional brands, try to get involved in streetwear to imitate something that wasn't authentic to their heritage? Um, Virgil said it's wild, you know, and it all goes back to the very first image that seems preposterous actually becomes the new norm. I was always trying to look at the positive side. So when I do see brands adopt a new mode of design, that's not traditional and not authentic. That's not in this. That's enough. It's, it's, it's actually inauthentic to me. If I this a validation that we ultimately, okay, let's continue. So this, this reminds me of something you posted on. So the question here goes, let me read it slowly because I'm stumbling on my words here. Uh, that reminds you of something that you posted on Instagram after the first Vuitton show. It was a picture of you taking your bow and the caption was, you can do it too. What was your in your head when you were posting that? To come from designing a graphic t-shirt in 2012 to making it to the house to design a collection is awesome. As a young black kid from Rockford, Illinois, from Irrigant Paris, from um, Ghana, West Africa, that was like impossible, you know, like categorically not going to happen in a lifetime. I thought that fashion was one of those industries that would reinforce people like that. Uh, this isn't for you if you don't have this shirt if you don't but it's true i understand why you'd think that because he was right next to carney when he was trying to smash the door down and i'm pretty sure if you're virgil there is i think he's got as far as he has got because of he's quite self-aware he knows his strengths so i'm sure the time that he was sitting next to kanye designing album covers and just being a creative dude he was very aware that kanye was a special one right if you look at the stuff off white dude the stuff that he's done for louis vuitton and you look at the stuff that kanye's done for yeezy from the ad campaigns to the editorials to the photographers used to the drops to the colorways of the shoes the designs you can see that kanye is definitely the special one right he's the he's the real like you know once in a generation talent when it comes to being able to apply his artistry in different fields and different kind of modes and different planes he's the one he's a special one so i guess if you're Virgil and you're seeing it's like you're seeing your best friend, he's finding it this hard to get into industry. You must be like Jesus Christ. I'm not even five percent of what he's doing, or he, of his level of expertise, and he can't get in. So it must, it could kind of dampen your spirits. But to see him get as far as he has done now is amazing. And again, the sky's the limit for this guy, isn't it? Like he could, he could become the creative director of IKEA if he wanted to. Um, da -da -da. So it's going following here. What does it say about Shriver being dead? Hmm. Yeah, here, here you go. So. Um, what do you think will happen to the idea of streetwear in 2020 he says right uh, this is the next decade so in ten, another 10 years wow i would definitely say it's gonna die you know like as time will be up in my mind how many more t-shirts can we have owned how many more hoodies how many more sneakers i think that uh like we're going to hit this like really awesome state of expressing your knowledge and personal style with vintage there are so many clothes that are cool that are in vintage shops it's just about wearing them i think that fashion is going to go away from buying box fresh something it'll be like i'm gonna go into my archive which is fair i think he's kind of looking at it more from uh the kids on instagram who are kind of posting their fits and stuff those kids wear a lot of archive pieces you see a lot of you, it's very rare you see a kid that posts their outfit online who has like really shiny brand new clothes everyone's wearing kind of stuff that looks a bit faded that might have been bought online that was kind of second hand that was from a past season nothing looks box fresh there are maybe a couple of items in their outfits but for the most part everyone's wearing different pieces because everyone wants to show that they're knowledgeable everyone wants to show that they're about this life no one wants to look like new money right no one wants that which is probably explains why someone like a little yatty or like an offset decided i remember i think little yatty said when he got money he just bought all the shoes that he couldn't buy when he was younger and even shoes before that right he just went out and bought a complete sneakerheads kind of wardrobe full of trainers which is good because i guess value wise you can always flip them if he wants to 
I think Offset did the same thing too. Um, so that idea of kind of, you know, faking it by just the stuff, faking your level of authenticity or your level of experience in the game by buying vintage stuff is cool. I'm not, I, I'm not against it. And also I think it kind of allows those new people who have the means to buy those things to appreciate where the stuff that they're seeing in, in the modern era has kind of come from. So it's all well and good. But I think to suggest that somehow the quintessential t-shirt, hat, uh, hoodie, um, long sleeve, socks, shorts, waist bag, sneaker, and bucket hat, streetwear staples are going to suddenly disappear is ridiculous, really. I think there's always going to be... Because, again, streetwear is the entry point for all men, mostly. Or for, you know, for the majority of the streetwear audience is a mostly a male audience. If you want to get into fashion or you want to get into design or you want to get into architecture, you want to get into graphic design, you want to get into creative directoring, to whatever it may be called, anything in a creative field, the one entry point that you get into is streetwear. That's your kind of gateway into kind of caring about things. And even if you're in, even if you're just working in an office job, part of the reason why you have an appreciation for fragrances or you care about the knit that you get for that you wear at work and you, you don't want to buy some shitty knit from H&M, you buy a John Smedley one or you go and buy one from Cos, it's because of your introduction to streetwear. It makes you appreciate um, the, the kind of mundane qualities in everyday items, right? Um, it kind of elevates your taste level. It makes you kind of interested in different brands. It opens up your palette of interest. And again, that level of loving stuff and caring for it is going to stay with you forever. So I think the idea of streetwear, what it gives you, what it imparts to you, the kind of path it kind of guides you on will never die. The items itself, I think, in my opinion, will never die because a t-shirt, a long sleeve, a hoodie, a baseball cap, a bucket hat, a woolly hat, a bomber jacket, a down jacket, a pair of jeans and a trainer's are the cheapest things a kid can wear to get swaggy, right? To kind of go out there and stunt. I saw recently online uh, on on the Uniqlo website, which is probably, you know, one of the biggest streetwear stores in the world if you want to get, you know, serious about things. They had this amazing uh, down jacket that's similar to like a North Face, right? A Noopsy style down jacket that they're selling for like, I think, 60 bucks. So if you're a kid and you want to get swaggy, you want to put on something nice and you want to mix it up and you don't have the means to kind of go head to toe Stussy, you can buy yourself a nice Stussy long sleeve a nice Uniqlo bomber jacket, some Uniqlo uh, indigo jeans, a pair of New Balances, and boom, your streetwear. Do you know what I mean? Like, so I think the idea that that's going to disappear is gone because that kid is all, is also going to decide, you know what, maybe I shouldn't spend 60 euros on a Stussy jumper. Maybe I should go and make my own t-shirt brand. And then they start making their own brand. And then from there, it kind of cascades. And again, it's it's something for, it's an entryway. It's a, it's a kind of uh, rite of passage for most kids when they're growing up and they want to get involved in fashion. So in my opinion, I don't agree categorically. I think streetwear won't die, especially not in the next decade. That's insane. Um, there are more kids than ever coming into the scene. Like these three models here, I don't know who the hell they are. They're new faces. They're probably all under the age of 18. And they're new kids involved in streetwear, involved in that kind of culture. And there's going to be more of them coming up, coming up again. Like, um, look at the kid that just started designing who was one of the models for a cold wool back in the day. Um, I think Samuel Ross is like, what, 27, 28 or something? This kid was uh, modeling for him five years ago. So he's, I don't know, what, 25 or something? And he's got his own brand that he's starting. So whatever kid he gets modeling for him is going to end up kind of graduating and doing the same thing. It's it's never going to end. It's never going to end. So, yeah, I don't think that's true. Maybe for him, he's probably trying to move away from the streetwear thing. And because, you know, if you're Virgil, you probably have to, there is some kind of level of admission that your trainers seem to be more impactful than your actual clothes, which is, you know, bad because, you know, you'd want your clothes to have some kind of impact. You want your friends to wear it, you know. None of his friends wear his clothes. It's not most, I don't know, apart from Chinese toys, I don't see anyone wearing it in a cool way. So there must be that kind of level of awareness of that. So maybe he's trying to force himself to in an uncomfortable position and trying to make stuff that isn't t-shirts and hoodies um which is cool don't get me wrong but to say that every, the whole industry is going to follow him it's not it's not true he's not some kind of you know thought leader for streetwear he did allow it to kind of you know he did breathe new life in it by kind of shining a light on some of the ogs and kind of speaking about it in glowing terms and really wearing it on his chest but streetwear was existed before virgil and it will exist after virgil's gone so i don't think that's true necessarily but again congratulations to him and all his success so anyway let's move let's move on that's it man a one hour of the show rambling too much thanks so much for tuning in the excellent thing show episode number 275 as per usual if you're watching via the youtube app smash that like button hit subscribe and leave me a comment let me know what you think of the show if you're listening via the podcast app leave me a five star review share it to all your friends let them know that i'm also here and i'll see you guys again tomorrow for an episode of the show until then then take care. Bye. Peace. Adios.